So in the previous video, I looked at how stars form and become what we call main sequence stars. Now what we're going to do is look at what happens when main sequence stars run out of their hydrogen fuel and start to form other stars like red giants, neutron stars, black holes, that kind of thing. So that's what we're going to look at in this video. We're going to look at how each of those different types of star is formed. We're going to compare them in terms of their temperature, their surface area and their luminosity. And we're going to actually plot them on a diagram called the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, where we can see the positions of different types of stars. So let's first look at how we start the process of the death of a star. So essentially, all the death of all stars starts the same way. What happens is they run out of hydrogen fuel and that means the outward radiation pressure starts to decrease. So when, they, when they're burning hydrogen or fusing hydrogen to form helium, their main sequence, but when there's a high percentage of helium and not much hydrogen left in the core, that means that they start to collapse. So once that starts to happen, we start transferring more GP into kinetic energy. So the core temperature starts to rise. And what that enables to happen is the hydrogen surrounding the core is now high enough temperature to start to fuse at a higher rate. And that creates a massive radiation pressure and that shell expands, but at the same time cools down because it's expanding. So that's why it becomes a red giant, because essentially the wavelength it is emitting goes from being white predominantly to being predominantly red. So we're now going to look at why that happened. So we first need to understand what a black body is. So a black body is something that we define as absorbs all kinds of radiation that come across it and it also emits all wavelengths of radiation. However, the most common wavelength that it emits changes with temperature. And that's what Wien's displacement law is all about. It has a relationship between temperature and the peak wavelength. And what it says is the most common wavelength you get is inversely proportional to temperature. So the hotter you are, the shorter the wavelength gets, which is why very hot objects grow blue. Or if the temperature decreases like it does on the outside of a red giant, that means we get a longer wavelength, which is why they are red as it cools. So that's why we end up with a red giant. And that's the same process to start with for all kinds of stars we're going to get. We get this process of forming a red giant. So in lower mass stars, we don't reach a point in the core to start with where we start fusing helium. That comes later on. And that happens because if we have lower mass, we don't transfer as much GP into kinetic energy. So the temperature doesn't initially get high enough to fuse helium. And this happens if the mass of the star is less than 1.4 solar masses or 1.4 times the mass of our sun. And because this was discovered by Chandrasekhar, I can never say that very well, that mean, that got known as the Chandrasekhar limit. Uh, so if the mass is below the, this limit, that means we're going to end up with a white dwarf. If it's above this limit, that's when we get neutron stars, supernovas and all that kind of stuff going on. OK, so we're not fusing helium in the core and we get this expansion of the outside. However, we are still fusing hydrogen at this point. So we're increasing the quantity of helium we've got and we're always transferring more GP into kinetic energy as helium builds up in our core. So eventually you reach a temperature where actually it does start to fuse and we start getting the core being very rich in carbon and oxygen. And this process releases a massive amount of energy and it's often known as the helium flash because it's produced by fusing helium. So this massive amount of energy causes a massive radiation pressure, which means the outer layers of the star get ejected from the star and that's called a planetary nebula when that happens. So that's the process by which all the out part, outer parts of the star are ejected leaving just a core behind. So the core is initially very hot um, but 
the luminosity drops very low because it has a very small surface area. So this is known as a white dwarf. So it's much smaller than a main sequence star, but much higher density as well, because it's made of little carbons and oxygens, that kind of thing, not hydrogen. Um, but because we're not having any more fusions, we don't have any radiation pressure to keep it in equilibrium. So it collapses to become very dense until something called electron degeneracy pressure equalizes with gravity. And this pressure comes about because when, as the star collapses, it tries to force electrons to occupy the same quantum state, or in chemistry terms, try and pack more electrons into shells than are allowed. So that is pressure as a result of something called the Pauli exclusion principle, which says no, um, no like electrons, neutrons, protons, or fermions, as they're called uh, collectively, can occupy the same quantum state. So the degeneracy pressure balances gravity, and we have a stable object. It's not undergoing fusion, and that's called a white dwarf. And over time, it cools and cools and cools until it's basically a very boring object in space. So that's a white dwarf. So we're going to use a Russell diagram to actually look at the different phases we've talked at so far. So down the middle, we can see this band that's called the main sequence band there. So on the x-axis, we can see we've got temperature, but as we go along, temperature decreases. And on the y-axis, we've got luminosity measured as multiples of the sun's luminosity. So on the left-hand side, we've got very high temperatures and high luminosities. And we can see because they're high temperatures, those are blue because they emit shorter wavelengths. On the right-hand side, they're cooler at lower luminosity, so they emit red, reddish coloured light there because they emit longer wavelengths. So our sun has a temperature of about 5,000 degrees, and obviously it emits luminosity of one times the luminosity of the sun. So we can see it's, uh, we can place it on the diagram. Uh, when it starts to die, it's going to become a red giant. So we can see an arrow plotting where it will travel on this diagram. Then eventually that red giant will have a planetary nebula and we get left with a white dwarf. So we can see it moves over to the hotter but less luminous side of the diagram there. OK, so that's our formation of white dwarfs and our Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. Let's look at what's frankly the more interesting part of star death, looking at supernovae, neutron stars and black holes. OK, so a supernova follows the same process as forming a white dwarf right up until the last stage. So a white dwarf stops when we have carbon and oxygen because it's not high enough temperature to fuse those two nuclei. However, if the mass is big enough, we can convert enough GP into kinetic energy, we get higher temperatures. And these higher temperatures do allow carbon and oxygen to fuse, and they form heavier elements like cobalt, which all end up in the form of iron, generally speaking, in the core there. So instead of carbon and oxygen, we've now got an iron core. So this process releases a massive, massive, massive amount of energy. So that creates something called a shock wave that explodes outwards, and that's what we call a supernova. And a star actually expels the majority of its mass during this phase. There's a massive amount of mass ejected into outer space. And this mass goes on to become other stars, other like galaxies, planets, comets, you name it. It comes from a supernova. So this process releases a massive amount of energy, so it's very luminous, because luminosity is essentially the rate of power of light energy. So emitting a large amount of energy means you're very luminous and bright. And we can actually see supernovae like right across the universe. They're very bright compared to other stars. So the iron core left behind is what forms either a neutron star or a black hole. Um, so that's where those come from. So let's first look at a neutron star. So when we've got left with the iron, the fusion process will essentially stop because we can't fuse iron into other things. And when you look at the radioactivity part of the course, you'll actually understand why uh, iron won't undergo further fusion. 
But because it's iron, the force of gravity is much stronger than it was in a white dwarf. So actually, the force of gravity is now greater than the electron degeneracy pressure. So electrons are not still not allowed to occupy the same quantum states. So what happens instead is that protons and electrons decay through a process called electron capture. And that results in producing neutrons and electron neutrinos in the end. So this is where the idea of a neutron star comes from because it's made of neutrons. So it's a very, very dense region of space. It has very strong gravitational fields, magnetic fields, those kind of things. So um, we've still got a force of gravity. So it, the core is still trying to collapse, even though it's been turned into neutrons. But neutrons are fermions too, so they also can't occupy the same quantum state. And so we get a neutron degeneracy pressure, which balances gravity, forming a neutron star, which is a very stable object in space. OK, so that's how we get a neutron star with those two forces balanced. And you might guess where this is going. If it is even bigger, we still have a gravitational force greater than neutron degeneracy pressure. So the entire system collapses onto itself, so it's concentrated into nearly a single point in space of near infinite density. And we call that a singularity. So around a singularity, because we've got such high density, we have a massively strong gravitational field. And as part of the gravitational fields topic, you'll have learned to calculate escape velocity, the, which comes from essentially working out the kinetic energy required to escape. So at a certain distance away from a black hole, the escape velocity becomes greater than the speed of light. And that's something called a, a distance called the Schwarzschild radius there. That's when the escape velocity becomes greater than the speed of light. So this point essentially forms a circle or a sphere effectively around the black hole. And that's called the event horizon, which you may have heard about with black holes. OK, so that's how we form each of our types of. So at this point, you should now be able to explain how we get white dwarfs, neutron stars and black holes. And you should when I say explain, you should be able to talk about it in terms of the forces involved. So like gravity, electron degeneracy pressure, radiation pressure, those kind of things. You should be able to compare the different types of uh, stars. So uh, main sequence, red giant and white dwarf in terms of their temperature, surface area and luminosity. And you should also be able to plot the path of a star like the sun through a Hertzberg and Russell diagram. So you should be able to essentially sketch what one of those looks like and show what will happen to our sun in the form of on the diagram there. OK, so that concludes this video looking at the death of stars. I hope you found that useful to learn some key parts of this topic. If there's anything that's not clear from watching this video, please do let me know by commenting on it so I can clear that up. But thank you very much for taking the time to watch.